Hello again and welcome back. In this installment, we are going to be covering a lot of material. We'll be covering standards, burdens of proof, religion, sex, pregnancy discrimination, developing law regarding sexual orientation, and sexual harassment. So we are going to be covering a lot of material in this segment. And we're going to start with our discussion again about direct and indirect evidence for disparate treatment cases. We've introduced this topic before, and I want to revisit it here just to make sure that we have a clear, comprehensive understanding, because this is important in terms of establishing rights and recognizing duties. Rights on behalf of the employee, duties on behalf of the employer. Direct evidence is evidence that the employer announced or admitted or otherwise indicated that, for instance, a protected classification such as race, color, religion, sex, or national origin was a determining factor in the employment decision. As an example, the hiring manager of ABC Corp makes a remark that he would never hire a Muslim. That remark is direct evidence as an admission that reveals a discriminatory animus toward the Islam faith in violation of Title VII's prohibition against religious discrimination. The example that I've used in previous segments, I'm the employer, the owner of the company, I fire Bob because he's wearing a blue sweatshirt. If I said to Bob, Bob, you are too old, that's an example of direct evidence. Rarely will that occur in situations today. Hopefully it will not. Hopefully that's not an express or even an implied animus toward an individual. However, that's an example of direct evidence. Indirect evidence is also known as circumstantial evidence. Inferences can be drawn from the circumstances surrounding the adverse employment actions, such as the situations involving hiring, terminations, decisions to promote, demote, etc. Comments, remarks, innuendos, and even patterns and practices measured over a period of time may evidence a discriminatory intent and discriminatory conduct. You should be aware when we study these cases and have discussions about direct and indirect evidence that can be used to establish whether violations of law have occurred. Let's talk about circumstantial evidence of discrimination. The Supreme Court has recognized that rarely, if ever, will there be direct evidence to establish a violation. Absent direct evidence, the Supreme Court has said there can be a prima facie case based on circumstantial evidence to establish discrimination. A prima facie case is a case that will be sufficient to establish a claim if it is not contradicted by rebuttal evidence. There are four elements which must be established for a prima facie case in a disparate treatment action. One, the individual belongs to a protected classification. That's a prerequisite. That must be established. Two, the individual sought a position or maintained a job for which he or she was qualified. I view the uh, second element as uh, establishing really qualifications or meeting the expectations for performance and conduct that the employer has. If the employee does not have the qualifications for the job, that can be a legitimate reason not to hire that respective employee. Or if, for example, the employee is not meeting conduct standards by the employer, such as whether the employee is habitually tardy or engages in other behavior, then that employee is not meeting expectations. And if that's the situation, 
the second element has not been established. Let me give you another, another example. If the employee has not met performance expectations, let's say that that employee has received through good human resource practices, a number of performance related warnings and notices. If the employee is later terminated, that individual is going to have very much uh, a hard time establishing the second element that they were meeting expectations or qualified to continue for the employment. Uh, so the second sec section is, is very important as all of these elements must be established for there to be circumstantial evidence of discrimination. Let's go to number three. Despite such qualifications or meeting conduct or performance expectations, the individual was not hired or suffered an adverse action. Again, we're going to continue to have a discussion about adverse actions throughout this course. An adverse action is something bad that's happened. As an example, the individual has been terminated, demoted, transferred. I think you get the idea. So element number three is, I refer to it as the something bad that happened requirement. If nothing bad occurred, then there's no action to complain about. Number four, the employer sought to hire an applicant whose qualifications were similar to that of the prospective employee outside of that individual's protected classification or in the event of a termination or demotion replaced the employee with an individual outside of the plaintiff employee's protected classification. So those are the four elements that are required to establish a prima facie case. You've received already in your uh, handout materials that were posted uh, an example of what's required for submission to the Illinois Department of Human Rights uh, of a prima facie case involving discrimination. You might want to take a look at what the Department of Human Rights requires in terms of a prima facie uh, showing in terms of the format. Uh, if you have any questions about that, uh, please, please contact me. If a prima facie case is established, then the burden of proof shifts to the employer. Keep in mind one important point. The burden of proof always remains with the plaintiff employee. The burden of production shifts to the employer, but the burden of proof remains always for the employee to establish in order for there to be a cause of action regarding discrimination, harassment, retaliate, retaliation. Once the prima facie case is established, the burden shifts to the employer. The employer must articulate a legitimate, non-discriminatory reason for its action. The plaintiff is then provided an opportunity to demonstrate by a preponderance of the evidence, and we'll get to that standard in just a moment, that the supposedly valid reason for the employer's actions were a pretext, which is an unlawful excuse for a discriminatory decision. The civil burden of proof for employment law claims requires that the preponderance of the evidence be established. The preponderance of the evidence is a more likely true than not true standard. Now let's think about that. With criminal cases, the standard is beyond a reasonable doubt. That's a much higher and much different standard of proof required for criminal liability than is required in this civil context. Preponderance of the evidence for the plaintiff to show is a more likely true than not true standard. If you think about a football field, and it's coming up on the time where you either uh, just seen the Super Bowl or, or the Super Bowl is upcoming, depending upon when you view this 
uh, recording, uh, what's, what's in the center of the football field? The 50-yard line. Once the employee crosses that 50-yard line, so to speak, toward the other side's end zone, using a football analogy, they've established a more likely true than not true standard required for preponderance of the evidence. Just crossing over into that other side's territory meets the evidentiary standards. So keep that in mind. It's much different than a standard of proof in a criminal context. Let's talk about religion. Title VII prohibits religious discrimination. Employers are required to make reasonable accommodations for an employee's religious observance, practice, and belief. Now we're going to visit again later in this course these concepts of reasonable accommodation and undue hardship. For our purposes now, we're keying in on these concepts relating to the employer's obligation uh, with respect to the uh, discrimination, anti-discrimination prohibition about religion. The elements to establish a prima facie case of religious discrimination are, one, the individual has a bona fide religious belief that conflicts with an employment requirement. In your textbook, Professor Twomey uh, refers to uh, the definitions of uh, religious belief and also the 1980 uh, guidelines from the EEOC regarding uh, religious beliefs. If you haven't examined those uh, definitions in the textbook, please do so. Number two, the individual informed the employer of such conflict. That's a concept, the concept of informing that we're going to be discussing in other contexts as well. Uh, the individual must inform or notify the employer of such conflict. That's when the accommodation requirement really sets in. If there's no information conveyed to the employer, the employer is not required to take action. And we're going to revisit that again, especially in the context of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which again will use or reflect the standards of reasonable accommodation and undue hardship. But it starts with the individual putting the employer on notice that a conflict exists, which then requires the examination by the employer. How can that, how can that conflict be accommodated so that it doesn't impose an undue hardship? And the third element is the individual suffered an adverse employment action. And again, I think we should have a clear understanding of what is an adverse employment action. Something bad has happened. A dismissal, a demotion, a suspension, something that is adverse to the interest of the individual employee. If the plaintiff establishes these three elements, the burden of proof shifts to the employer to offer a legitimate non-discriminatory reason for the adverse employment action. Thereafter, the burden of proof shifts back to the plaintiff to show that the offered reason by the employer is a pretext. That word pretext really means an unlawful excuse. Let's focus in on the section within your textbook regarding items worn for religious reasons. And I want to also draw your attention to uh, course materials that you should have received by now uh, entitled Harassment, 
retaliation and discrimination rights and reprimands. Uh, within those course materials, you're going to see the case involving EEOC versus Abercrombie and Fitch stores, which is a Supreme Court case decided in 19, I'm sorry, decided in 2015. Samantha Eloff applied for a job as a salesperson at Abercrombie. She is a devout Muslim who believes her religion requires her to wear a headscarf. The company had a dress code that prohibits its employees from wearing, among other things, caps. The fact that she was not hired was later attributed to her wearing the headscarf. The case was based on Title VII and brought under the disparate treatment theory of discrimination. The court held that considering an applicant's need for an accommodation was a motivating factor in the decision not to hire and was enough to proceed on such a disparate theory of discrimination under Title VII. There was no requirement that the employer actually knew that there could be a conflict between an applicant's religious practice and a work rule. Now that's a bit unusual from what we've just been discussing regarding putting the employer on notice. The Abercrombie case involved a case uh, of hiring, the failure to hire, which is a violation of Title VII. Because the evidence established that Samantha Ellis' non-hiring was attributed to wearing the headscarf, that was sufficient to invoke the protections that Title VII affords regarding the uh, religious standards and anti-religion discrimination. I'd like you to turn in your textbook to the case of EEOC versus Kelly Services. Now, that should be in your textbook on page 420. In that case, it's a U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit which ruled that Kelly Services did not discriminate against a Muslim woman when it decided not to refer her to a client company because she wore a kamar. She had informed, she had been informed by a Kelly staffing supervisor that you should have to take your scarf off, you cannot cover your hair. The applicant replied that she could not remove her kamar because her religion required her to wear it. She was informed that the company had a safety-driven dress code policy prohibiting all employees from wearing loose clothing and headwear of any kind. Professor Twomey uh, suggests that even if the EEOC established a prima facie case of religious discrimination, and this is what the case indicated as well uh, by the circuit court, Kelly provided a legitimate non-discriminatory reason for its employment action, which was not shown to be pretextual. The EEOC asserted that the employer could have reasonably accommodated her by allowing her to tie her Kamar back like people with long hair were allowed to do. However, the company came back and explained that hair is a permanent aspect. A Kamar is different from hair because of the risk that the Kamar, like a hat, could fall off into the machinery. So there was a safety-driven reason for the adverse action, and that was sufficient to establish that the reason was not a pretext. Whenever there is a safety factor especially involved or a health concern involved, that will be usually considered as a legitimate non-discriminatory reason and non-protextual. So please note the difference between these cases and every situation is going to be different. You're never going to find the exact same situation in an employment dispute. Our task is to apply the law to those facts and arrive at a conclusion. Even if that conclusion has been uh, decided by one court, it doesn't mean that 
either the employer or the employee is going to have to accept that conclusion because our law grows and our common law develops through the adversarial process, which entails appeals. Ultimately, the Supreme Court may become involved, as you've witnessed already in these case studies, and decide, based on its opinion, what the law will be. Let's turn briefly to the subject involving body art, work rules, and religious beliefs. And again, this is also found in your textbook. Please examine the case of Clodier versus Costco. A very interesting case that was decided a little over 12 years ago, but still very relevant today. In Clodier versus Costco, the first, first Circuit Court of Appeals dealt with an employee's claim that her employer's ban on body art was a form of religious discrimination. Kimberly Clodier was a member of the Church of Body Modification. Costco's grooming policy prohibited any visible facial or tongue jewelry in order to present a professional image to its customers. Now, Ms. Clodier wore an eyebrow ring as a religious practice, so she said. Costco offered to return her to work if she wore a Band-Aid or plastic retainer over the jewelry, but Ms. Clodier said that such would violate her religious beliefs. Now, you'll note that the employer tried to accommodate those beliefs by that overture. The EEOC's 1980 guidelines broadly define religion to include moral or ethical beliefs as to what is right and wrong, which are sincerely held with the strength of traditional religious views. The guidelines do not limit, as Professor Tomey indicates, religion to theistic practices or to beliefs professed by organized religions. Since Clodier would not accept an accommodation short of exemption, the Court of Appeals determined that it was an undue hardship for the employer because an exemption would negatively affect the company's professionalism. Now, please note the case of EEOC versus Red Robin Gourmet Burgers which was decided a year later by a district court. A different outcome with respect to religious tattoos uh, surrounding the uh, uh, restaurant's assertion that tattoos contravened the company's family-oriented image uh, was, was established in that case. Note the distinction. Ask yourself, what's the difference? Was there an undue hardship that could be accommodated? Those are the standards. Those are the inquiries. That's the analysis. Let's discuss the religious organization exemptions. This is the exception to the general rule. The general rule would be that it is against the law to discriminate on the basis of religion. That's Title VII. However, in some settings, there will be recognized exceptions carved out by the legislature as well as judicial interpretations. Let's discuss the case of Fieldstein versus Christian Science Monitor. That's a case that's reported in your textbook on page 422. This case should be examined very closely. It's extremely relevant, even though it was decided back in 1983. Just briefly, the facts are that Mark Fieldstein inquired at the Christian Science Monitor whether there would be a job opening on its news reporting staff once he graduated from college. On making that inquiry, Fieldstein was instructed to contact the personnel department of the church where he was asked if he was a member of the Christian Science Church. He indicated that he was not. 
and was informed that he would stand little, if any, chance of becoming an employee of the Monitor, as only Christian scientists were hired except in very rare cases. Uh, Fieldstein nevertheless requested and obtained an employment application for a reporter's position. And the application uh, required information relating to uh, whether he's a member of the Christian Science uh, Church and whether he subscribes to Christian Science periodicals and engages in uh, Christian Science uh, religious activities. Ultimately, of course, Mr. Fieldstein was not hired for the job, and he brought a claim based on alleged religious discrimination. What was the outcome of this case? Did Mr. Fieldstein prevail? Well, the answer is no. The Christian Science Monitor argued successfully that it is exempt from the general rule, so-called. The court found that the exemption provided for religious organizations to all of their activities, both secular and religious, allowed for the non-hiring of Mr. Fieldstein. The Christian Science Monitor was found to be a religious activity of a religious organization. So it was therefore permissible for the Christian Science Monitor to apply a test of religious affiliation to candidates for employment. Now let's think about this. The outcome rule would be that if there is a religious organization and if it meets these standard qualifications, then it may discriminate on the basis of religion. That is an exception to the general rule. And that same general rule exception is also noted in the case of the uh, Bishop of the Church of Latter-day Saints versus Amos. Now that's a United States Supreme Court decision that was decided in 1987. That case is also reported in your textbook on page 423, and it involved a constitutional issue as well, whether section 702 violated the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment when it's interpreted to allow for religious employers to discriminate on religious grounds regarding hiring and granting of tenure for non-religious jobs. And you'll read that the district court's decision was reversed and ultimately the Supreme Court weighed in on this topic and determined that uh, the, there was no uh, discrimination in such fashion. Let's turn to the case that's not reported in your textbook, uh, but I wanted to bring it to your attention because it was decided by the Supreme Court in 2012. In this case, and you can read about it if you choose uh, by uh, online access or otherwise, it's entitled Hosanna Tabor Evangelical Lutheran Church and School versus the EEOC. In this case, the Supreme Court recognized the existence of a ministerial exception under the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. Let's talk about the general background facts. A Lutheran congregation uh, was uh, uh, sued for firing a school teacher for insubordination after a dispute relating to her reported disability. The Lutheran school hired the plaintiff initially to teach kindergarten as a contract teacher. A year after she began, the teacher completed required theological and religious studies to qualify as a called teacher. Called teachers are regarded by the church as having a vocational call from God and carry the title of minister of religion or a commissioned member of the church. The teacher taught math, language arts, social studies, science, gym, art, and music, 
using non-religious textbooks. Non-called lay teachers at the school similarly taught these subjects. However, four days a week for 30 minutes, the teacher taught a religion class and attended chapel with her class once a week for 30 minutes. She also led her class three times a day and performed other religious duties. The Supreme Court ruled that churches and other religious groups must be free to choose their leaders without government interference. The Establishment and Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment bars lawsuits on behalf of ministers against their churches, claiming termination in violation of employment laws. Hence, the ministerial exception trumps anti-discrimination laws. I thought that we should examine this case in light of the Title VII prohibitions against discrimination, and especially recognizing that there are exceptions to that general rule. Let's talk about sex discrimination. So we're moving on to a different area for which Title VII prohibits. Title VII prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex. Courts apply the plain and ordinary meaning of the word sex. Employers who discriminate against female or male employees because of their sex violate Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and, of course, as amended. Before we get to the pregnancy discrimination aspects, which uh, were amended in 1978, uh, an amendment to the uh, Title VII Act, I want to just go back and reference the Title VII uh, prohibitions. Uh, you've already seen this in your textbook, it's in your handout materials, but Title VII provides that it shall be an unlawful practice for an employer one, to fail or refuse to hire or to discharge any individual or otherwise to discriminate against any individual or otherwise to discriminate against any individual with respect to his compensation, terms, conditions, or privileges of employment because of such individuals' race, color, religion, sex, which we'll be discussing uh, throughout the balance of this, this segment in more detail, or national origin, or two, to limit, segregate, classify his employees or applicants for employment in any way which would deprive or tend to deprive any individual of employment opportunities or otherwise adversely affect his status as an employee because of such individuals, race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Let's turn to pregnancy discrimination. In 1978, Title VII was amended to include pregnancy discrimination. The act includes discrimination in employment based on pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions. The amendment prevents employers from treating pregnancy childbirth, or related medical conditions different from the treatment of other, other disabilities. In other words, women who are disabled due to pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions must provide, or I should say, must be provided with the same benefits as other disabled employees. And this includes temporary and long-term disability insurance, sick leave, or other job benefits. Now, there's a caveat to that requirement. If the employer does not provide disability benefits or paid sick leave to other employees, then it will be exempt from providing such benefits to the pregnant employees. In other words, those benefits which are provided to uh, other employees must be provided to pregnant employees, there's not a prerequisite to focus on pregnant employees and provide those individuals with benefits which others do not receive. 
I want to draw your attention to the pregnancy discrimination uh, laws in Illinois. In 2015, the pregnancy discrimination uh, laws were changed in that pregnancy discrimination became a separate protected classification. Uh, in your materials, which are included in the harassment, retaliation, and discrimination rights and reprimands uh, sections, you're going to have a whole section regarding the pregnancy and discrimination accommodation amendments to the Illinois Human Rights Act. And that act imposes upon employers affirmative obligations to offer reasonable accommodations for pregnancy and child-related conditions. Such accommodations may include providing more frequent or longer bathroom breaks, breaks for increased water intake and periodic rest, light duty opportunities, temporary transfers to less strenuous or hazardous positions, accessible work sites, acquisition of modification of equipment, job restructuring, even time or modified work schedules. So there are a number of obligations imposed as a duty to accommodate pregnant women in the Illinois workplaces uh, that go beyond the Federal Pregnancy Discrimination Act requirements. So again, I think the lesson learned is to be aware of the laws in your given jurisdiction. There may be overlap. Some of the laws may be far more expansive under state uh, legislative enactments than under the federal. It will all depend upon the subject matter and uh, the uh, jurisdiction. I wanted to draw your attention also to the developing law regarding sexual orientation and transsexuals. Uh, that obviously is a topic for discussion. It's been covered in the news. Uh, we'll hear about this topic uh, from judicial decisions and legislative enactments from state levels uh, and, and so forth. It's an interesting topic and I wanted to make sure that we had an overview regarding this developing topic as it relates to Title VII under the gender or sex category. Title VII does not protect against discrimination based on sexual orientation. You'll note that that uh, rule was from a, a decision from the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals within our jurisdiction. But that's the rule. Title VII does not protect against discrimination based on sexual orientation. 